But today is all about grounding and bonding. And my intent is to kind of do a sliver of discussion about the grounding and bonding book that ARRL publishes that we're going to use as a textbook for a four hour presentation of grounding and bonding on the morning of uh, Saturday, the 4th of uh, November in this room. And so I'm going to do a little bit of chapter three and a little bit of chapter four and a little bit of chapter five because frankly, and a little bit of chapter six, those four chapters, because that's essentially the guts of the grounding and bonding book. So I'm going to start out by saying uh, that grounding and bonding is all about electrical safety. And no matter when I do an electrical power systems course, and I am a power systems engineer by training and practice and professional licensing, I always start by talking about electrical safety. And there's probably one tip that I could leave with you about electrical safety. Uh, I'll say most of you are men in this room. Sorry, ladies, but it's applicable to you too. I will suggest that many of you are married and many of you have a wedding ring on. Stick that hand with that wedding ring in your pocket. Now, when I was 22 years old or 26 years old and teaching at the Air Force's graduate school, I told my young lieutenants, take your wedding ring off because you don't want to be wearing that when you're around electrical equipment. Well, I got a whole bunch of ladies upset with me, so I've modified my, I've modified my lectures uh, in about uh, 1978 to say, put the left hand in the pocket when you're working with electricity. Now, why do you do that? Yeah, say, so if I create a great electrical circuit between my left hand, or better yet, by the metal electrode on my left hand, fourth finger, and my right hand, you know, by putting it between one piece of equipment and another piece of equipment, I could potentially have a voltage difference between me. And what happens between that voltage? Well, it's going to go right through the heart, ladies and gentlemen. And it only takes about 50 microamps of current through the heart to begin the process of defliberation, where the heart loses its ability to have a rhythm. And I don't know if you know how the heart works. The heart squeezes the blood. So if you were to ever look in slow motion at a heart, the muscles of the heart literally keep squeezing. And if the heart goes into fibrillation, what happens is instead of having a nice rhythmic squeezing of the blood through the heart, and the, uh, the heart pumps about 2,000 gallons of blood a day, so it's a big machine. If it loses that rhythm and goes into some kind of jerky action, you lose that pumping action that's not good, okay? So if I could leave one message to you about electrical safety, left hand in the pocket, or at least don't create that electrical circuit. Well, there's another electrical circuit. I got my left hand in my pocket. I got my right hand trying to hang on to this, uh, and this was the other day, the, uh, um, what the heck, 110 volt uh, uh, fire detection unit up in my attic, up in my, uh, uh, ceiling of my second floor kind of precariously hanging over the uh, balcony into the fall into the first floor holding this up like this um, on a metal ladder by the way <laughs> can you get the drift here yeah. don't create the electrical circuit now I actually didn't do that because my my practice when I'm even working with 110 volts and 110 volts under the right conditions is enough potential difference to cause 50 microamps or more to flow through the heart. Now, you know, frankly, not everything goes through the heart. Uh, I unfortunately had a, an electrician working for me when I was a young lieutenant. Uh, one of the best electricians uh, that I knew. One of the most safety cautious electricians that I ever knew. And he was electrocuted and died. And he did everything right. He was working with safety gloves. He had uh, uh, the proper kind of electrically non-conducting boots but he just thought the electrical circuit was uh, de-energized. He was told it was de-energized. Uh, he had lockouts on the electrical circuit, but he failed with one, one condition. Test it and make sure that even though you think you've shut the power off, even though you have locked out that circuit so nobody else can put it back on, test to make sure that it is indeed de-energized. It so happened that the uh, safety switch, when he pulled the uh, disconnect, the blades 
stayed in the on position. They actually broke off inside of the disconnect. Now, I would have thought he would have felt that. Either there was not enough tension or the sucker was hard when he pushed it or pulled it. Either way, he was not here today to talk about that. Left behind a great family and uh, really sad. So electrical safety, you can do everything right, but doggone it, sometimes or another your ticket comes up and uh, we don't want any of you in that condition. So please, first of all, think about the left-hand rule, okay? Think about the uh, proper uh, PPE or uh, personal protective equipment. Yeah. Ooh, look at this, this is great. And uh, now I see why you said my 50 microamps look funny on my slide. Okay, I think it's how it's rendered. On my slide, it's actually a micro for 10 to the minus 6 amps. It's sufficient for a 160-pound man or woman if the internal impedance is around 2,000 ohms. Keep that impedance up and that current will be down. Even 12 volts can provide enough electrical current under the right conditions to kill you. Now, you can have arguments, and Westinghouse and Edison had great, uh, great uh, arguments in the early uh, part of this century, last century about uh, which is worse to electrocute you, AC or DC. And uh, I won't get into those arguments. I have my views that uh, uh, DC is worse than AC. But I know Mr. Edison felt that AC was worse than DC. So there you go. Uh, he may have been so biased in those conversations. I don't really care. Uh, 60 hertz or zero hertz, there's still going to be a potential difference causing, an, through an impedance, can cause enough current to cause a problem. Don? Uh, suggestion that all, also if you've got a metal oh, watch band. I always take them off. Yeah. Uh, I mean, as I say, I... Case, it and the ring both get hung on yep. a carabiner clip so I don't lose them. Yep. Uh, eyeglasses, gloves, safety boots. If you're going to work on a f concrete floor, be sensitive of what a concrete floor does. It provides a great conductive path. Enough on electrical safety. How do the slides get turned to the next slide? Thank you. A little bit of definitions that we're going to talk about on the, on the course. Uh, first of all, uh, AC equipment system grounding. Your house has a ground rod on it. If it's up the code standards, it actually has two ground rods on it. You may not see the second ground rod. If you're going to put ground rods in the earth, put them at least the distance that they are long. So if they're eight foot ground rods, they should be at least spaced eight feet. ARRL recommends six feet or more. My training was put two ground rods on the ground, lay one out, put the next one eight feet, one ground rod away from the first. Why do you do that? Why two ground rods separated by a distance? Well, because this ground rod's doing two things. It's draining electrical current into the ground, but okay, current through a resistance is equal voltage. So there is an earth voltage, a voltage around the earth at that ground rod that dissipates each inch away from the rod, rod you go. If you separate them, the potential that this one will dissipate into the earth and this one dissipates in the earth will in fact not intersect. Grounding is about two things. Getting the current away from your equipment and keeping everything at the same voltage. Two things, voltage and current. Okay, another term, bonding. If, well, let's go back here. AC or equipment grounding, what is it there for? It protects the station from overcurrent and short circuit conditions. Whereas what we're doing with electrical bonding is actually protecting the people from if they in fact come in contact with two metal non-current carrying metal surfaces. I don't want any potential between this thing here and this thing here. Potential difference through the body, current in the heart. So yeah. bonding puts everything at the same voltage. The grounding ensures that the current goes to ground and that everything is at the same voltage. Earthing is of course all about the grounding. Those are the terms you'll read in the National Electrical Code. We'll go for a whole hour talking about the National Electrical Code and what is an equipment ground conductor, what is a equipment grounding electrode, 
and how you tie these together. If you bond the electrical neutral, excuse me, the neutral of the electrical circuit to the green wire, and where do you bond the neutral and the green wire? We're going to spend a whole lot of time in the course talking about electrical power systems work. I'm teaching that block. That's actually the block I've taught for years. We're going to talk a little bit about lightning protection grounding. That grounding that is there typically on towers and metal masts that may be external to the house. They need to be grounded. But they're grounded for lightning current. Lightning current is actually a fairly high frequency current. You know, we hear lightning strikes, uh, or we hear lightning noise in the AM band in the lower 160 and 80 uh, megahertz bands. Do we hear, uh, do we hear much lightning up on, uh, on 10 meters? Not really. Not like you do on 80 meters, right? Not you do in the AM band. So what's going on here? Well, the electrical current that dissipates in a lightning strike is actually a high frequency current. And we'll be we'll talking about that high frequency characteristics. And then we're gonna spend some time on RF management. And the ARR belt book is really correct. It's not about RF grounding, radio frequency currents grounding. It's about how do you manage the RF currents that float around in your shack. <clears throat> I will say that grounding at the uh, 28 megahertz, 10 meter band, is an impossibility. It's a myth that you can ground at that unless you have a really, really short lead to earth because the impedances are so high. Not resistance, but reactance and capacitance. Next slide, if I could. So we're going to pull another slide, and we're going to talk about this a little bit. And this may start a controversy, and I, I don't mind laying the controversy out here because we're going to spend some time on Saturday morning talking about this. So if you were to go to the National Electrical Code, you would find that there's Article 250 about grounding and bonding. It tells you everything about how to do service entrance grounds and the like. There's also a section in the National Electrical Code that most people skip because it's not applicable to them. Most electricians skip because it's not applicable to them. It's Article 810 that deals with television and radio stations. And in the small print notes, it says, and amateur radio stations. So residential and commercial industrial facilities that have TV or radio stations, including amateur radio stations, must follow Article 810. And reading all the stuff in a nutshell, what it basically says, your tower needs to have a tower grounding system. Your antenna feed wire needs to have a surge suppressor, uh, a surge suppressor to it. You need to have your service entrance grounded, your station grounded, and your tower grounded. Now, I don't think anybody disagrees that you should ground your tower. I don't think anybody disagrees and if you did tough Fairfax County uh, building inspectors would force you to have a ground at your service entrance. Now there may be some people that quibble about, well, why put a ground, a separate grounding electrode for my station? We can quibble about that. But where people get into great controversy is, should you in fact bond, that is to say, connect your service entrance grounding system to your station grounding system to your tower system? Show of hands, how many people want to bound those things? Okay, uh, there's maybe six, seven people. How many emphatically say, I will never tie my tower grounding system to anything? I want it to be out there floating on its own. Show of hands. Oh, not much controversy. Okay, mid split. Some people don't know enough to say either way. This is probably one of the two biggest controversies in amateur radio. I, for years, have suggested do not ground your tower mass to the rest of your system. And my rationale was, when that sucker gets hit by lightning, I want it to sit out there and float at whatever voltage it's floating, and I don't want anything going to anything else. Okay, well, I read the book, and I'm now, and I also, by the way, read Article 810 of the National Electrical Code and said, gee, even if I wanted to have that philosophy, the building inspector is going to force me to bond them. Now, let's talk about this. If this tower is more than 50 or 60 feet away from the rest of the electrical system, 
putting any kind of bonding wire in there is not going to make a difference at all. Because remember, I told you these are high frequency currents that are flowing from lightning. And about 50 or 60 feet of wire is high enough impedance that if you put that in there, that, w that current's not going to go there anywhere. Well, that could say, okay, then I'm all right, because if the currents never go in there, it won't ever affect my system. Here's why I believe the National Electrical Code is so emphatic about bonding these. And it isn't about what the ARL recommends, which says, look, if your tower's more than 50 feet away from the rest of your grounding system, don't worry about it. I believe the reason the NEC has said put them together is not about the high lightning strike currents that might occur on the, on the tower mast. It's about all that other periphery stuff like rotor controllers and the like with 110 volts or 24 volts or whatever they use to control the rotor, those voltages could spuriously end up in the tower system. And I want to make sure that all those systems, go, all those currents go to ground. Not just at the mast, but I also want to make sure the voltage stays the same throughout the system. Not the high frequency lightning strike currents, but all the other peripheral voltages that are out there. Now you argue, well, what if I just have a mast and the mast is there to hold an antenna up uh, so there's no rotor on it, no other you know, auxiliary systems? Should I bond or not? Um, jury's out on that subject. The National Electrical Code says yes. As I said, as a pup, I said never bond your tower to your house ground because I was focused on the lightning currents. As I've grown up in this business and as I tried to rationalize this relatively new section of the National Electrical Code, it's only been around for about 10, 15 years. It was about voltage and this issue of keeping non-current carrying metal parts of equipment at the same potential so there isn't a potential difference between you between those equipments. I'm going to stop right here. I created enough controversy with that first question. <laughs> Should you bond the mast system? I'm going to leave it for others to talk about, maybe during the break in the other room or whatever. Should you disconnect your antenna when you're not operating your radio station? Okay. How do you handle the second floor shack in order to ensure? Okay. Uh, well, there's another. One. Okay, hadn't, I hadn't even, that one's not on my list. These are the kinds of things we'll be talking about on the fourth. So, with that in mind, I didn't bring an uh, outline for the course, but I should have. It's a course that starts at 8.30, runs until 11.30, I think, uh, that's, or 11, something like that. Uh, three basic lectures, Chapter 3, which is Electrical Safety, Electrical Service Entrance Grounding, or AC Grounding. Chapter 4, Lightning Protection. Chapter 5, RF Management. Chapter 6, Practical, practical Applications to These Questions. Uh, there are one or two seats left. We've kept this course, this first offering, small because we're experimenting with the material. I've already figured out I got way more material than I have time to present. So uh, we're probably going to have to be a little bit judicial in, in some of the conversations because, as I said, some of these conversations can go on for a long time. Uh, I've been teaching grounding and bonding for 40 years, and frankly, the science is changing over time or at least the practice of it is changing over time as people rationalize what's going on. Uh, there are several good reference texts out there. With that, I think we're done or close enough to be done. Uh, we'll wrap up here and go into the other room. Thank you very much.